look, the, the thing is my girlfriend back then, she woke me up the next morning. I think I was still a bit tipsy and I was lying <laughs> in bed and she normally puts the radio on while she's getting ready for work. And I sort of dozed off and I could hear the DJ saying, and tomorrow night the Springbok nude girls will be appearing live <laughs> at the, and I thought, oh, cool. And I quickly woke up and quickly wrote it down. And then that evening I met up with a, with a band and I said, well, I've got a cool name for the band. It must be Springbok Nuggles. And then I mean, she said, Tranche, I said, but one problem, there's no girls in the band. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, exactly, exactly. That's why. Super awesome. <laughs> you know how many people are going to come watch us? Uh, yeah. Nude girls? I mean... Uh. And it worked like a bomb. It was a charm. It was an instant uh, cultural kind of phenomena, the name, because obviously it brought back to the older generation the thing of the Springbok hit parade albums. Yeah. Of the, 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 the cover girls, there was always cover girls sitting on a bonnet of a car, naked, <laughs> semi naked, stars in the nipples. And, uh, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, and, and then it was just um, also the, the fact, part of our success with the thing that we also actually sounded quite unique. Um, as much as I want to sound like Nick Cave and a lot of people, <laughs> you can't sound like other people. You can only sound like yourself. And then also because Theo was a Pantera, quite more metal guy, and I was a bit more Pixies and mm. more alternative. Blue Man, France, sort of shared also more of alternative vibe. And then eventually Adrian, when he joined us, he was into um, acid jazz and more clubby stuff. Yeah. So the conglomeration of all these um, different tastes in music um, created a very unique sound um, for a grunge band to kind of have trumpet in was quite weird. Um, and, you know, the fact that I, my voice sounded unique and I used a lot of delays. And so we created a, a massive sound uh, and our songs were very eclectic. And we did from reggae. We went from in some songs. We went from reggae to punk to jazz and then back to punk. And so I think it was really interesting um, for the people back then. And it was just such a vibe. The 90s was... The 90s, there was, there was a stage where it was all about experimenting and being different. And like I think every generation probably, except now it's not very, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't hear a lot of interesting things. It's all kind of the same. But also, I mean, you guys had come out of that real suppressed sort of a state in, as, a, as a nation. And then everyone was like, check at me, look at my, this is my creativity, yeah, dress myself. True. You know? So, yeah, we came out of an area of um, under the pillow, smothered under the pillow. Mm -hmm. And then when we got out, that's probably why we did jazz, reggae, and disco all in one song. <laughs> 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 yeah, Makes total sense. <laughs> yeah. And just while we're talking about lyrics, um, your song Blue Eyes, which is just an absolutely uh, beautiful song, uh, one of my favorites it captures a really sort of sad time in south africa maybe maybe you could sort of explain how you came to those sort yeah. of very deep lyrics okay so basically um i wrote the lyrics after i heard a story from a friend of mine who was a, a police psychologist this lady um in the end of apartheid um the cops all went home. Everybody kind of hated them because they were seen as the last protectors of apartheid. Mm. And they would go home and they, you, you've got your, your service pistol with you at home. Um, the whole world hates you. There's not enough money to feed the family. Why, why, why you get drunk? And in that period, there was a lot of family murders amongst cops. Mm. So my friend told me about this situation. So, uh, and then she told me about this story where this guy wiped out his whole family, except his little blonde daughter was hiding in a cupboard somewhere. And by the time he wanted to kill her, he came to his senses. He got her out of the cupboard and he drove to the police and he gave himself over. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, and that is where the story comes from. We're going to grow you up, sir. Daddy's little blue eyes are come for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm, so, and that is what that comes from. But, you know, like songs, everybody, I mean, 
<clears throat> that is what it's that's what it, the song is about for me but every everybody's got a different yes. interpretation you know some people will probably sing it to their little um child and you know yeah. it's a loving thing which yeah. it is yeah yeah just yeah. <laughs> just just pull out the family yeah. murder story yeah. wow. it's a beautiful just, song yeah it is beautiful yeah, yeah. Absolutely beautiful. yeah. Song. Yes, I, absolutely. I actually I actually got goosebumps when you actually said that now. And uh, I was listening to it uh, before we started the podcast just to kind of get in the mood. I think that's an important lesson like for anybody, do something that you love, that makes you happy, that you're passionate about. And and, and that'll come out in the work you do, like you said, you know, because if you're doing something and it's contrived because you want a certain bunch of people to like you, it's just not going to come over as authentic and you're not going to do well. Look, in, in art, you, you're going to know, and I find it in painting and in music, you always know it sucks. You've always <laughs> got a, if you've got a feeling that, uh, I mean, there's about so much, so many times in the, in, the, in the 90s and stuff, we make music videos and I would go, ooh, this is a, I've got a feeling about this. This is not good. And then it comes up and you cringe. Oh, it's so God. terrible. Some of, the, some of these 90s videos are so, so bad. So um, I, from then I've, I've learned to, you've got to follow your gut and just make sure, if you know something is a bit shaky, try and fix it because you're going to live with it for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's really great advice. You also spoke about, you know, just... Um, amazing journeys that you've had through different places, but also obviously you've played at some amazing festivals, Opi Kopi, obviously uh, I've had a great party there, Glastonbury V Festival and a whole bunch of others. What was it like playing in front of big crowds like at a festival and, and which one was your sort of favorite? Um, well, uh, Shepherd's Bush Empire, we did a couple there. It was, I think we did We've done many shows at Shepherd's Bush Empire, but I mean, uh, there was one stage where things were really crazy, um, where they almost asked us to uh, stop the show because they were, <laughs> they were scared that the galleries were going to collapse. No way. Because it was just, uh, the people, uh, was just incredible. You know, the energy of the audience and stuff. Uh, Opi Kopi, there was a couple of shows that was just crazy but i think it had to do with the fact that we won lsd <laughs> <laughs> something to do with it maybe yeah. but i mean you know it went from, we were like the first first one of the first people to play it be copy and it went from five thousand people to 15 to twenty five thousand in a couple of years so it was such a vibe you know um yes. But like everything that goes up, it must come down. And uh, today it's not uh, as successful as it used to be. Um, but it's, again, it's just because the world has changed and music has changed and the way how we uh, listen to it and what type of music uh, is out there. Uh. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy Cape Fold Mountain.